But J.D. Stillwater has been a science educator for over 20 years. He's a science ambassador who's now going around the country um, talking about science and spirituality. Uh, and he is a council member of IRIS and also the secretary for the Religious Naturalist Association. And anything else you want me to say? Okay. So let's get to the presentation. Enjoy. Thanks, it has been quite a morning, um, and our car sounds more like a Harley. I think I'm going to have to start calling it a Carly. <laughs> um, it's loud. It's really loud. So, and I have to say, I'm really glad to be here. Um, any other Parliament first timers? It is for me. Yeah, it's it's just amazing that representatives from so many of the world's religions are here together reaching across theological and scriptural divides. Now, I should tell you, I did my best in this talk to use language and imagery that tries to be inclusive of everyone. And the fact is that I'm an old cis white guy from a Christian majority country. So please, if anything in the talk is offensive or problematic for you in any way, I hope you'll tell me about it afterwards so I can grow and learn from this experience. Thank you. Still having trouble hearing me? Well, I was afraid you, of that. If people are having trouble hearing, what should they, they should do this, and then I'll know. Yeah. But I'm going to try to talk as though the microphone isn't needed. All right, let's start with something that maybe, if I'm really lucky, might be a little bit funny. Have you heard the joke about the atheist who gives a talk in Ireland? Well, an old man stands up during the Q&A to ask, is it the Catholic God or the Protestant God that you don't believe in? Well, that felt totally <laughs> So here we are at the Parliament, reaching across theological and scriptural divides. But what if there were no scriptural divides? Or in other words, what if there were a common scripture that was shared by all religions, all the religions that are here this week? Okay, I'm going to try one more time. My co-worker brought a CD version of the Holy Scripture to work the other day, and he got upset when I asked if I could burn a copy. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing like a good joke, and that was nothing like, like a good joke. joke. <laughs> However, it brings up an important point about what we mean by a Holy Scripture or by a sacred text. Pagan priest of Starhawk once wrote that something is sacred when there is no end, no goal that would justify its destruction or its desecration. And that suggests that sacred texts describe things or ideas that must be protected, revered, cherished. Now, just this past week, I learned about a podcast, a relatively new podcast, called Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. <laughs> so this Harvard Divinity student named Vanessa Zoltan began reading the classic fiction book Jane Eyre as part of her studies, as though it were sacred scripture, just to see what kind of spiritual meaning she might glean from it. And she and her professor were astounded at how beneficial that study was. And the effort grew into a study group using the Harry Potter books as though they were sacred texts. And it grew and became a podcast. And now, eight years later, 16 million people have downloaded it and presumably benefited spiritually from studying the Harry Potter books as though they were scripture. And that's in spite of J.K. Rowling's dismaying transphobia and anti-Semitism. Their point is not that Harry Potter is a sacred text. It isn't. They chose it because it's well known and there's a lot going on in, in the story's plot. I mention it because I think if this can work with Harry Potter, of all things, it could work with almost any text, right? So what these people are doing is exegesis, which means interpretation of a text, especially sacred text is how the word is usually used. And Vanessa and her team say, in big, bold type on their website, we believe that in treating texts as sacred, we can learn to treat one another as sacred. I'll take some of that. <laughs> and they emphasize that this works with Harry Potter. It works because of three things. Trust, rigor, and community. Trust that the text can yield generous rewards or could yield generous rewards. Rigor, 
Well, here's how they put it on their website. Quote, the text in and of itself is not sacred, but is made so through our rigorous engagement with it. And community in that it takes a village to be uplifted together, to make holy meaningfulness from a text studied in community with others. So if millions of people can extract spiritual enrichment from studying the Harry Potter books, then I think if we had a global text that we regarded as sacred, globally, interfaithly, interfaithfully, what miracles could arise from interfaith study of a text like that? Especially if we studied it with trust, rigor, and community, in community. I think the world might be very different from the one we live in now. If we had a common scripture, different people would probably make different meanings from it. And that's okay. As you know, the billions of people who study the Hebrew book of Genesis have all kinds of takes on the role of women, for one example. I can't resist. What did God say after creating Adam? It's what? not good. I can do better than that. <laughs> What's not funny is how some in this country's history used Genesis to justify slavery. And there are still people now that think that way. Clearly, any one text can sometimes yield vastly different interpretations. So a common scripture, if we had one, doesn't necessarily prevent misuse of it, or it doesn't guarantee religious reconciliation, but I think it might help. At the very least, we could have some shared holidays and um, a common language, common scriptural language for addressing challenges, from personal challenges to, to global crises. At heart, Religious scriptures are about spiritual experience, right? So join me a moment. Just, just take a moment to close your eyes and remember a time when you felt profoundly spiritually inspired or totally at peace or deeply connected in some way. Take a few deep breaths and put yourself back there. Remember where you were and how it felt. And when you're ready, take another deep breath, open your eyes, and if you're willing to share briefly about the context of that experience, raise your hand. I'd like to hear. Yeah, go ahead. The experience that came to mind were, was a, a large group ritual in our community. Uh, we had focused on building up to this ritual for a number of days, uh, a lot of intention about heart, harmony connection and uh, the culmination of, of this ceremony I place a large heart on a fire which uh, we burned to release to the universe and everyone was chanting and singing and I was just in a real blissy state of connection with everyone uh -huh. yeah so the, what I heard is kind of common themes through that is connection with other people and with everything sounds like sounds like you felt deeply connected yeah any others yes um, this was at the end of a women's retreat. We took like a day trip to the top of, of a mountain and it was springtime and all those little fragile flowers were in bloom and a, a misty cloud came over all of us and we were in different places but we were on this mountaintop with the, the mist um, surrounding us. All right, so I'm hearing a very natural setting but also in community. There were other people there. Any others? Go ahead. I was floating in a lake, uh, my hometown, and it was in the middle of summertime, so the sky was that particular shade of blue, you know, that sort of electric blue, and there were a few poofy clouds, and I could hear the water, you know, everything was a little muffled, and the water was making kind of that sound, and I just felt completely weightless and completely connected. Beautiful. Yeah, when I ask this question, almost always what people say it regards being in nature or natural settings in some form, or deep connection with other people, sometimes a conversation or something like that. This is what we think of when we think of spiritual experience. So 
Here's my big reveal. We do have a common global scripture, and you've been living and worshiping in its pages your whole life, perhaps never considering its spiritual potential, its sacred depths, if you will. I think it's tremendously rich in theological content. And we might disagree about the divine provenance of one another's traditional scriptures, but this one, nature, reality, this one we know to have been directly personally written by the Creator, however we perceive and name that ultimate source of all that is. Our common scripture is nature, creation, natural reality, a vast cosmos that we now know to be at least 47 billion light years across, a universe that includes all of us here on Earth, along with uncountable other Earths. Did you know there are more solar systems in the visible universe than there are grains of sand on Earth. Let that sink in for a second. There are more solar systems in the universe than there are grains of sand on Earth. Imagine if your own holy scripture, whatever faith tradition you come from, imagine if that scripture or that text contained a sentence like this. The sun is a fire bigger than a million Earths and there are more suns in the heavens than grains of sand on earth. What meaning would you make of that as you studied it? How does it feel to contemplate that this morning? Does it expand your feelings about who or what could have created such a cosmos? Now imagine that that sentence isn't just a sentence in a book recorded by a revered prophet long ago but a present-day reality you can see with your own eyes. Imagine that anyone can see it and engage with you about what it means to them and how <coughs> they feel knowing it. How do you feel knowing this? Anyone? Yeah. So it, it's humbly and unfortunately too many humans um, are arrogant enough to think that we're the height of creation when we're not. We're just one little blip. And with untold, you know, they go, well, if there's aliens, why haven't they talked? The vastness of space, creation happened at the same time. Who says that anyone has the technology to reach out to other planets, other systems, but to imagine that there is no other sentient life in the universe is ridiculous. So for you, very humbling. Just the vastness of it. Yeah. Any others? Incomprehensible. Incomprehensible. So a little bit mind-boggling. Any others? Yeah. Awe and wonder. Like, just... Awe. I mean, I'm looking at that sand, and I'm like... I'm, I, complete <laughs> awe. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> so, again, when I ask this question, almost always some or most people say that they feel really small. It's humbling. They feel insignificant. So we're going to stick with that for just a moment. Astronomer Neil deGrasse Tyson agrees with that. He says, we are a speck on a speck on a speck on a speck. Really, really small. And it's true. One of those pictures, this one, is a photograph of Earth taken by Voyager 1 from beyond the orbit of Neptune. Your entire life, all of human history, all of evolution took place on that tiny speck. Carl Sagan described it as, quote, a pale blue dot suspended in a sunbeam, end quote. Just a speck, right? Humbling. On the other hand, as far as we know now, we are the only complex life in the entire universe. It's here on this planet. I agree to presume that is a little silly, but as far as we know, this is, this is where it's happening. In two trillion galaxies of stars, this may be, this tiny dot may be the only place that has eyes, that has hearts, the only place with love, the only place with minds to appreciate and, yes, revere all of it. So, are you a speck? Or are you precious beyond measure? 
Yes. Science, you're right. <laughs> right. Science just d describes, and in that regard, it's a text, right? It doesn't tell us what it means. It doesn't tell us what to make of it. Science concerns itself with what is. It's up to each of us to determine what it needs for us. And human beings are hardwired for this. We're hardwired for making meaning from our surroundings. We can't avoid it. We think in metaphors and analogies. And when scientists are doing science, it's crucial that they hew as closely as possible to the raw facts. And it's really important not to confuse our models and our metaphors with reality itself. But make no mistake, meaning will be made from new knowledge, one way or another. So when scientists and science writers insist that the cosmos is devoid of meaning, well, they may be right, but at best, I think they leave a void that will get filled with something. And at worst, they encourage people to reject science altogether out of hand. Because you know, our guts tell us that nothing is completely meaningless, right? So again, am I a mere speck or precious in my sight? You beat me to it. I say both. I say yes. For me, being both minuscule and precious, it instills a kind of durable humility, along, along with a sense of responsibility. It says to me, I'm not in charge here. I'm not in control. And what I do really matters. I'm a terribly small part of something incomprehensibly vast. And nevertheless, I'm an essential part of it. In 2017, I was fortunate to travel to Oregon Central Desert with a group of students to see the Great American Eclipse. And I, I knew it would be a cool astronomical event, but I, I really had no idea what I was getting into. The experience was, was ineffable, and all my attempts so far to describe it have fallen short, but I'm going to try one more time this morning. So there was a feeling of excitement for all of us there when the moon made first contact with the sun's disk and then began devouring it. And it happened slowly over about an hour, a time spent for all of us just brimming with anticipation. Gradually, the light around us dimmed, not suddenly or obviously, but the whole world began to look thin, papery, kind of two-dimensional light. And you can sort of get that in this picture. And then it was dark, not, not midnight dark. The horizon still looked like early dawn, but all around, not just in the east, right? And up straight up, up above, stars twinkled clear and bright as though it were midnight. And tendrils of misty light streamed out from the ominous black disk where the sun had been just a few minutes before. I was intensely aware that this misty light I was seeing from the sun's corona traced this laser straight line of conscious connection from my eye up just th through the atmosphere and just skimming the edge of the moon and then reaching all the way out 93 million miles to the sun, drawing me in a way into their primordial dance, the moon and the sun, a dance that that conjoins space and time, and marries dynamism with stillness, and connects descendants with ancestors. But these weren't thoughts in my head that I, I ground through. They, I felt all of them. I felt them with my whole body all at once, kind of like jumping into a pool on a really hot afternoon. It was overwhelming, and it was breathtaking, and it was beautiful. And then it was over. Those two brief minutes of totality were painfully short. I wanted it to stay. And I, I exhaled and discovered that I was sobbing with joy and awe. If you get a chance to see a solar eclipse, take it. Take it. It's a profound spiritual experience, for me anyway it was. And for those based in North America, the next total eclipse here is on April 8th, just a few months from now. And then no more on this continent for about 20 years. Oh so God. don't miss it. Hotel reservations are going to go very, very quickly. In fact, some of them are already selling out. So get on it. <laughs>
Richard Lou says, well, the question before we leave that, was one of the parts of your awe that from our perspective, the moon and the sun are almost exactly the same size? And how, how amazing is that? Very. Absolutely. Yeah. There would be no solar eclipses if they weren't just the right sizes and proportions and distances for that to be true. Yeah. Does, that, does that sort of help you realize that maybe there is, there is some kind of divine creator or something? You're making meaning from the science, and that's why we're here. So absolutely, each person in the room has to respond to that in their own way. That's sort of my point. I don't think we need to agree on that. Richard Louvre says, all spiritual life begins with a sense of wonder. I've spent many years now, more than a decade, collecting and cataloging awe-inspiring wonders of natural reality like this. And I've been calling them rev revelations because they get revealed as sciences do their work. And I'm afraid that even if we had a thousand hours for this session, I could barely scratch the surface of a few of them. But I want to run through a few more. Can you hold it until the end? I'm a little concerned about time at this point, partly because my spouse back there is going, hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> so play with me for a second. Bring to mind a prophet or a teacher at the root of your faith tradition, whatever that is. Could be someone like Moses or Baha'u'llah or Buddha, someone like that. Take a second, just bring someone to mind. Everybody got someone? Who? Just call out a few names. Jesus. Okay. Joseph Smith. Jesus, Joseph Smith. Krishna. Krishna. I missed one. There was one somebody called out. All right. Have your person in mind. And now take a deep breath with me. You just breathed in over 13 sextillion air molecules. In one breath. Every breath. But here's the thing, over 700 million of the molecules that came in with that breath were at some point inside the lungs of the prophet or teacher you were thinking of. The same is true of everyone who lived more than a few decades ago. That same breath also included air molecules from every animal that ever lived. Every plant that ever lived. They're all, in a way, right here in the air of this room with us. Now, knowing all that, take another breath. Feels a little different, doesn't it? Some of the oxygen molecules you just breathed in a moment ago now are you, part of your body. They've come alive by being part of you, part of your body. <coughs> Turns out there are more solar systems in the universe than grains of sand on the Earth, and there are more water molecules in one tablespoon of water than all the stars and sand grains combined. Wow. Air and water molecules are so small and so numerous, and they cycle around the Earth so constantly that every cup of beverage you swallow contains over 150 million water molecules that actually pass through Jesus' body during his lifetime. And if your prophet or guru or teacher lived more than about 35 years, then it's even more than 150 million water molecules in every cup that you drink. Every time. That's the science. What does it mean? Mm -hmm. To me, it means that all water is holy water. And when I consider that as I drink, which I would like to do because I left my water somewhere back there, <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping someone will bring it. When I consider that when I'm drinking, and obviously I don't do this with every drink, but I try to do it as often as possible, I, it, I feel like it connects me with all of those ancestors on this dynamic living planet and with the holiness that infuses every moment that I'm alive. Thank you so much. Here again, it orients me, like with the stars and sand grains. It help, helps orient me squarely within the stream of flowing matter and energy far greater than myself, far vaster than my daily struggle. There's one tradition that I'm aware of where the blessing is, may you never thirst. Mm -hmm. 
Beautiful. When I meditate on science revelations like this and interpret them like the chapters of a religious text, some consistent fibers kind of pop out for me, like golden threads, if you will, in nature's tapestry. I see patterns that have meaning not only for me personally, but that offer, I think, to help heal a wounded society on a critically ill planet. I call them the insights, and I want to just skim through three of them. First, let me say that what I'm about to share is partly science and partly exegesis. It's interpretive meaning-making from the findings of science. Somebody else might look at the same science knowledge and interpret it differently, make their own meaning from it. Unity. The kind of genetic testing being done pretty routinely now makes it clear that every human being on the planet is a distant cousin. The people in this room are all cousins of each other. How do we greet a cousin we've never met that turns up at a family reunion? Well, this is a family reunion, so let's practice. Turn to someone sitting near you who you don't already know and say, Hello, cousin. I'm so glad to finally meet you. Hello, cousin. I'm so glad to finally meet you. Hello, cousin. It is so good to see you again. So good to see you again. You too, cousin. And hello, cousin. Hello, cousin. How was that? No, I didn't have time. I could hear their laughter, so I know I have a sense of how it was. But of course, this isn't just for people who are easy to know and get along with. I'm also, talk <laughs> I'm also talking about the panhandler that I ignored yesterday, and the guy who cut me off on the road, the guy who stole our catalytic converter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Probably a guy, right? And um, people with unfamiliar ways, and world leaders that I regard as evil, those are my cousins too. And this does not thrill me. It's not all sweetness and light. I don't like that the water I drink has been part of people who do awful things, too. Revelations are not always comfortable. And isn't that true of most sacred scriptures? Discomfort is part of the spiritual journey. Yes. Our choice is to face the truth of it or to live in some kind of superficial denial, right? All humans are cousins. Every conflict is a family conflict. Every war, a civil war. Recognizing this, for me, is profoundly spiritual. And this deep kinship I'm talking about doesn't stop with people. Those same genetic tests and many other lines of evidence reveal to us that every living thing on this planet is blood-related even the ones with nothing like blood in their bodies. And really, not all that distant from me and my human cousins either. This is my 304,325,256 cousin, 110,385,693 times removed. Her name is Olivia. She has a successful career in the recycling industry, and she's always been kind to me. In this video, she's celebrating because she found the perfect ball of feces to raise her children in, and I can't wait to meet my new baby cousins. All kidding aside, I'm not kidding. It's true. The tree of life is a family tree, and it has branches for every living thing on the planet. It's not just someone's conjecture. There is overwhelming evidence that this is a fact. And we can map out precise relationships between species based on the genetic code. We humans are neither the root nor the apex of the tree of life. We're just one leaflet on one small branch. That's the science. Now, what meaning are we going to make from it? How will we treat our kin? And it's not just living things either. Here on Earth, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and the lithosphere, these are interconnected, inseparable systems 
and we live on and inside them. They flow through us. Rocks dissolve in water and get washed to the ocean, then become seashells, then maybe bird bones or rocks again. River becomes ocean, then cloud, then apple, then human, then air, everything, everywhere, all at once, up, down, across and beyond, or across and around, with interconnections and shortcuts and cycles within cycles. Here on Earth, all boundaries and distinctions are either arbitrary or temporary. Earth is one thing. It's not separate from us. It's not even separable into distinct parts because of that flow. It's one living Earth organism. Earth's matter flows through me, minute by minute, <laughs> right now, coming from elsewhere on the planet and going on to other adventures after me, every time I breathe or drink or go to the bathroom. And until recently, I, I used the word interdependence for this, probably we all have. But that word has never felt quite adequate to me because we're not separate objects that depend on trading materials and energy with other objects, right? We are integral elements of a larger whole. I am the water cycle and the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle, kind of like my blood and bones are my body. They're not all of it, but they're not separable either. So a few months ago, I learned the word interbeing as used by Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh. And I think interbeing fits better for what I'm talking about here. I'm not a distinct but interdependent object. I exist as an integral interbeing with a living planet. And that interbeing extends beyond Earth, too. Every atom on Earth came from somewhere, and now we know where. So all the atoms heavier than hydrogen and helium were forged inside the <laughs> furnaces of exploding supernova stars. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> stars make all those other elements out of hydrogen and helium. Remember, this is the origins of our bodies we're talking about. Did you know that the main elements in your body are in the same order of abundance as elements in the universe as a whole? Except for helium and neon, who <laughs> they don't play well with others, and, and they're extremely rare here on Earth. And I want to show you a short clip about this, because it's... it's Perfect. I know that the molecules in my body are traceable to phenomena in the cosmos. And that, and it's our 15 pounds of gray matter that figured this out. There's a kinship with the cosmos that resonates deeply with new age thinking, but I'm not apologetic about that. It's what we find. If whatever we find is resonates with whoever, go ahead, take it. And when I reflect on our kinship with the cosmos. When I do the calculation that shows that a 15 ton meteorite that we have in the center of the Rose Center for Earth and Space, it's an iron meteorite. When I do the calculation that shows that if you take all of the iron from the hemoglobin of the people in the tri-state area of New York City, you can recover that much iron out of their blood <laughs> and realize that the iron from that meteorite and the iron from your blood has common origin in the core of a star. Tell me what part of my brain is lighting up, because that excites me. That makes me want to grab people in the street and say, have you heard this? So this is me grabbing you in the street. <laughs> <laughs> Your body, my body, our bodies are microcosms of the cosm, of the cosmos. You are a reflection of the whole, acting within the whole, for the whole. Going back further, we also know where the first atoms of hydrogen and helium came from. They came from light. Those first atoms condensed out of really intense light energy at the beginning of time in a process scientists call Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And later, gravity connect, collected those atoms, those hydrogen and helium atoms, together to make the first stars which exploded to make all those heavy atoms, which gravity collected again to make planets like this one. 
So taken in context with lots of other passages from the scripture of nature, to me this means that my family tree goes all the way back to the dawn of time. I am interbeing with everything in the universe. We are the universe, come alive, in a state of total unity with all of it. Centuries before modern cosmological science, the Islamic poet Rumi said it this way, you are not a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. <coughs> Cooperation. When I was a child, my parents were Shackley distributors, which meant that for us kids, a treat was a Shackley energy bar. <laughs> and believe me, they're nothing like candy. So one day, I noticed that a colony of ants had chewed a hole in the wrapper of an energy bar that had fallen unnoticed under a radiator in my parents' office. And to their credit, my parents treated this as a science project and just let them eat. Those ants were fascinating to me, and I spent hours on my belly watching them, day after day. Just, I noticed how they walked in thin lines, like highways, complete with passing lanes, and how they always touched antennae with each other as they passed. And within about a month, those ants had carried off the entire bar, one tiny little mouthful at a time. Why am I telling you this? Well, survival of the fittest does not mean survival of the strongest or the fastest or the smartest. The fittest means those who are best aligned with their environment. And environments change. So fittest means different things in different times and places. And in the 600 million years of life on this planet, survival of the fittest has most often meant survival of the most cooperative. There is competition, it's true, between individuals and also between species. But survival, as you know, is often a team sport. So cooperators almost always have an advantage. The worker ants moving that cricket, they're sterile. They have no chance of having baby ants of their own. They're working to support their sisters and nieces who will have babies for the whole colony. So cooperation is the essence of almost every major advance in the complexity of life on this planet. In the eukaryotic revolution, which is this blue arrow actually, um, single-celled bacteria engulfed but then didn't digest their own neighbors. And that benefited both of them. Those internal cooperators became essential organelles in our cells these billions of years later. Uh, like the mitochondria in your cell is a remnant of this. And um, the chloroplasts in plant cells. Then later, single cell, um, single cells, single celled organisms cooperated in groups to make multicellular organisms. And up until that time, there were no organs, no blood, no stomachs or brains, things like that. So cooperation allowed for specialization in those multicellular creatures like ourselves. Still later, some of those multicellular creatures started cooperating in societies like ants and elephants and wolves and people. The fossil record consistently reflects this, greater and greater scales of cooperation building on top of each other, building up layers of biological complexity. Living things cooperate in larger and larger assemblies. And when that happens, new potentials, new qualities can emerge. And all of this only happens if there's diversity. No evolutionary change can happen in a population if its members are all clones of each other. When there's diversity, natural selection has something to work with, promoting alignment with the environment and hindering misalignment. And it's important to mention here that natural selection works on populations, not individuals. So the darker colored moth here is just as likely to be eaten by a bat if both of them are flying. I must have missed a slide. This darker colored moth, right? If they're both in the air, they're both just as likely to get eaten by a bat. And they both could have landed on a light colored birch tree, and then the roles would be switched. 
The lesson here is not that some individuals are better than others, quite the opposite. It's that diverse populations have more survival options, kind of like a football team that's proficient in more plays or a musical group with a larger repertoire. And this is true of cultural evolution too. If we all spoke the same language and worshiped the same gods and ate the same foods, we would all be far less adaptable as the world changes around us. So diversity is a prerequisite for resilience. Cooperation and diversity are winning strategies in the evolution of life on this planet. That's the science. What does it mean for us today? I think this gathering, this parliament, is a testament to unity with diversity. Cooperation between diverse perspectives. And to me, that's another expression of cosmic creativity. How fragile we would be spiritually if we all had the same beliefs and the same rituals. I think religious and spiritual diversity provides our grandchildren with options as they face a changing environment, right? Natural reality, as science reveals it to us, could be a source of great unity between our various faith traditions. The work of science itself is done by representatives from every major faith tradition on the planet, and they share their process and their findings globally for everyone, for all humanity, to take inspiration from if they choose to. More than nations, I think, more than religious organizations or NGOs, really more than any other human endeavor, science is people from every culture and nation and faith working together to, refi to reveal the secrets of creation. So whether you call it creation or physical reality, we meet and engage with one another in this world. However we might disagree about the nature and naming of transcendent realities, we generally agree that the earth is round, right? The DNA sequences guide the development of our bodies, that microscopic pathogens cause infectious diseases, that our devices based on quantum effects and tiny transistors actually work, right? But the culture wars urge us to think of science as some kind of enemy of religion and spirituality claiming that science reduces all the magic and mystery to the mundane mud of materialism. Well, I gotta tell you, the last 150 years of science have done just the opposite of that. Every discovery, every dark frontier illuminated, reveals even greater mysteries beyond the shores of our knowledge. Every new revelation, nature's glory and intricacy grow with these discoveries, sometimes by leaps and bounds. And in me, they inspire an ever-expanding awe of the creative forces that birthed all this. I think if the world's religions really want to work together for freedom and human rights and democracy, we might consider starting on common ground. Well, natural reality is the only literal common ground we have. And here we are living in it as it. Those grow around here, by the way. They're really fun. What if our sources of inspiration and spirituality included one that's based on what we know alongside what we believe? It includes my beliefs while also informing them and enriching them. And it's true that sometimes new discoveries make us reconsider our beliefs in a new and more expansive light. And that's a spiritual practice too. For me, it's had powerful implications for who I am and for what's important to me. And I think it can have powerful implications for others and, more importantly, for interfaith dialogue, which is why we're here. For example, does the kinship of all living things resonate similarly or differently for Hindus and Muslims? for Jews and Taoists, Jains, Christians, Mormons, pagans, atheists. What could they learn from one another once they go a little deeper than polite appreciation for each other's distinct beliefs and rituals? The fact of this kinship is something we all share because we are it. We are that kinship. 
I think it's a solid ground for supporting deep and authentic interfaith dialogue. It's one chapter of humanity's shared global scripture. When something is sacred, nothing can justify its destruction or desecration. I invite you to regard natural reality as holy scripture and to study what science reveals about it in that mindset. Approached with trust that studying nature can yield generous rewards, rigorous, earnest engagement to make it sacred, and doing so in community, global interfaith community. Natural reality as science is revealing it to us could be the biggest, widest, most inviting bridge between faiths ever proposed. When we treat nature as sacred, knowing that our bodies are one with the whole of creation, we might just come to treat one another as sacred too. Sacred elements of a sacred planet, minuscule and precious in a vast and glorious cosmos. Thank you for choosing this session. If you'd like to stay in touch with me and my work or come have me come speak with your organization, there are cards on a chair back there and some QR codes for my website and stuff, and you can also sign up for my newsletter. And I see that it is 11.58, which kind of blows my mind. <laughs>